Welcome to the second episode in the Visual Group Theory podcast. Last episode showed several things in which symmetry shows up, like crystals and dancing, and promised that we would see what math has to say about those things. Math can help us get specific about how a situation has symmetry, but first we have to answer the basic question, what is symmetry? So here's our working definition. An object or situation has symmetry if it looks the same from more than one point of view. For example, a starfish looks the same from five different points of view. There are slight marking differences that might look different from one of these points of view versus the other, but ignore all those small details for now. As another example, most human beings look the same in a mirror as they do face to face, again, ignoring small superficial differences. Using mathematics, we can expose and study the intricate and sometimes beautiful relationships among these different points of view. Today's episode shows relationships in a few example situations and teaches how to find and diagram those relationships in any situation in which you find symmetry. We'll learn through two examples. Our first will be an easy one, this propeller. It looks the same from three different points of view. Person number one looks at blade number one, person number two at number two, and person number three looks at blade number three. We're going to explore the relationships among these points of view by shuffling them up. There are two ways to do that. We can ask the viewers themselves to move. For example, if everyone takes a step to their left, they interchange their points of view. And when they're done, the propeller looks the same to each of them as it did before. Doing it again yields another configuration of viewpoints, again looking the same to everybody. And doing it again puts them back where we started. So one way to change points of view is to move the viewers. Another way is to move the object. Instead of moving each person to their left, we could rotate the propeller counterclockwise and achieve the same two new points of view. Here's the first. Here's the second. The first advantage of this choice is that we can stop drawing the viewers altogether. That leaves less clutter in our diagram, and it's easy to remember point of view number one was, our, was on top and we numbered them clockwise from there. So, we want to see the relationships among these different points of view. This is a simple example, so it might already be clear to you that these points of view relate by being in a cycle. We saw that rotating 120 degrees rearranges them, so let's clearly record that fact. Rotating counterclockwise by 120 degrees goes from the left configuration to the right configuration. Furthermore, yet another 120 degree rotation would put them in yet another configuration. And then, rotating 120 degrees counterclockwise again puts it back in the original configuration. This three-step cycle is more naturally represented as a circle, so let's do that. What I've done is measure the symmetry in the propeller and diagram it. Here we can clearly see that the symmetries in the propeller are a cyclic kind of symmetry. This figure is called a Cayley diagram, and it illustrates a pattern that mathematicians call a group. We'll talk more about groups in future episodes, but for now we're just learning how to diagram them. So, let's review what steps I took to produce this diagram. First, number the locations of the object where viewers would stand to get the identical points of view. Second, move the object around to rearrange those points of view, those numbers, and record your work with connected copies of the drawing. Last, make the final diagram as presentable as possible. It ought to retain the symmetry of the original object, so you want to try to bring that out. Now, before we try another example, this procedure needs two clarifying footnotes. First of all, what does it mean to manipulate the original? Two warnings. First of all, you can't just move it around however you want. You have to rearrange the numbers. So for example, we did this 120 degree rotation counterclockwise, and that did rearrange the numbers. Where one was, two now is, and so on. However, we couldn't just do a 60 degree counterclockwise rotation. That wouldn't rearrange the numbers. It would just move them. Each viewpoint has to take a position that used to be occupied by another viewpoint. So this is no good because the viewpoints were not rearranged. They were just moved. Also, after you move the object, it has to take up the same space as it did before. For example, this propeller, if we could flip it over, would look different from the other side. And then with a slight move and twist, we could rearrange the viewpoints, even though the propeller would look different. But this is not allowed. 
because this object is not taking up the same space as it was before. You can see the difference in those gray areas. So those are the two clarifying footnotes that go with uh, the second step in our process. And then there's one that goes with the third step in the process. What does it mean for the diagram to be a final diagram? How do you know you're done exploring and making this diagram? The diagram you end up with should answer all questions about how the configurations relate. For example, we started working with the propeller and we got just this far. This diagram does not answer the question, what happens if I rotate again? Right? We see what the 120 degree counterclockwise rotation does from the original configuration, but not where it goes from there. So to answer that question, we had to expand our diagram. And still, this diagram doesn't answer the question where the rotation leads from the rightmost picture, so we had to expand it again. This diagram answers all the questions about rotations, and so that diagram was complete. And that was the diagram we rearranged into a circle. So here's the procedure for making a Cayley diagram of the symmetries of an object or situation. So with those two footnotes, we have a very specific procedure for creating a Cayley diagram, and we can now practice it on one more object, our friend the starfish. It has five alike arms, giving five identical viewpoints. We can rearrange them with 72 degree turns, because that's one-fifth of 360 degrees. And I'm going to save time and just do this in a circular layout from the beginning. So here are 72 degree counterclockwise rotations of the starfish, five of them in a row. So the red arrow just means 72 degrees counterclockwise. I won't write that each time. We'll save some space and the fifth one gets us back to where we started. But the starfish has more symmetry than the propeller, not just because it has five steps in its cycle, but also because a starfish can be flipped over and it still takes up the same space as it did before. Now, I know that a real three-dimensional starfish doesn't look the same when you flip it over, but for now, let's just pretend that this starfish is just this two-dimensional picture. So the blue arrow here is going to mean flip the starfish over like it's a page in a book. We can see that this diagram is not our final diagram because we've only seen where the blue arrow leads from the top starfish. But we're starting to run out of space here, and we're not anywhere near answering all the questions of where this blue arrow leads. So I think I'm going to need to make some more space in this diagram. Let me take those five original starfish and spread them out a bit. So now let's see where these blue arrows lead. If I flip the top starfish over, I'm going to move it to the, into the center of the circle. The reason I'm doing that is because I've seen this diagram before and I know what a convenient way to lay it out is, so I'm going to save time and just lay it out in that convenient way from the beginning. Now we ask, where does that blue arrow lead from some other starfish? Well, let's start with that one inside the circle. Turns out that flipping him over like the page in the book leads again to the top starfish. So that blue arrow is actually a two-way street. We can just erase the arrowhead. Now let's move to the starfish on the right. Where does the flipping action lead from him? So we'll flip him over, move it into the center, and connect it with the blue line. We can do this for all the starfish in the circle, and we find five completely new configurations. If you were exploring this on your own for the first time, you would have to check as you made each of these new configurations whether or not you'd seen it before somewhere in your diagram. But as you can see, if you look carefully and compare them all, these are five new configurations. So this diagram almost answers all the questions we need. It tells us where the blue arrow leads from any starfish, but it doesn't tell us where the red arrows lead from the inner ring of starfish. I'll save us the time and give you the answer. They lead counterclockwise on the inner ring. So here is the Cayley diagram for the starfish and its symmetries. When we look at Cayley diagrams, we don't usually want to see starfish in them. We usually just want to see their mathematical structure. So for that reason, I'm going to replace the starfish here with nodes, so we can just see the structure of this group. This group is called D5, and we'll talk about it again later. The propeller group also, we could remove the propeller so that we just see the simple structure of a three-step cyclic thing. This Cayley diagram is of a group called C3, the third cyclic group, and you can see why. As a teaser, let me show you some other Cayley diagrams. Note the symmetry inherent in each one. After you've seen these, you can try making some Cayley diagrams on your own. For example, what are the symmetries of this triangle? Or what are the symmetries of this rectangle? Or this square? Or this tetrahedron? Hours of mathematical fun await.